doesn't seem to register anywhere else or with anyone else. And so I kicked this series off and then I asked five other people to share with us the one thing that they are the most passionate about right now, the one thing that God has placed in their heart. So as we enter week six of this series, our final week, I am really excited that Kevin Rush is going to share the thing with us today that's on his heart. Kevin is a friend of New Hope, but he's way more than that. Uh, Kevin is part of the New Hope family. He served on staff here many, many years ago. Um, he had planted City Edge Christian Church in Cleveland, and he has served Jesus in a number of ways. And through all of this, uh, he has learned some good, he has learned some helpful, and he's even learned some painful lessons. And I think through all of this, he is the perfect person to share with us about the kind of faith and the type of faith that God is really looking for from you and from me. And so church, as the final week of the series, uh, again, I want you to prepare your heart. Prepare your heart to hear from Kevin. Prepare your heart to hear from God because God is the one who has placed this passion in Kevin's heart. And I want you today to catch some of what you hear. Take full advantage of everything that Jesus is going to offer because he wants to take your heart from a flat line and he wants to make it beat faster today. I'm back. I'm like a, like a, that skin rash that shows up every couple years, and you're like, what is that doing there? And I need to get that checked out. And so um, if you haven't um, been here for a long time, if you're new here, um, I am like a plague that comes back from time to time. And some people are like, get him out of here. And other people are like, I love that guy. And it's like 50-50. Um, literally, the greeters were talking about like, hey, uh, don't move so much, because I'm a little bit spastic, a little ADD, because... I only brought six tomatoes, and I got to make sure I hit you in first service. So um, that didn't help. It didn't happen, um, luckily, or for me, luckily for me. But you, you never know um, what might happen. Now, um, Rob asked me to come do this series, which got me uh, thinking a lot about faith. Now, it's the summer, and it's, I mean, it's questionably summer, right? It's like 70 degrees out. It's like, where did, usually now it's like 100 degrees out, and you're dying to swim, right? You're dying to go out in the pool. See, my kids love swimming. They love going out in the pool. And if you didn't know, I'm uh, living the dreams surrounded by four gorgeous women, my wife and three girls, uh, Selah 9, Aaliyah 7, and Mila 5, and they're about that height. And uh, I love them to death. And one of the things that um, I always want to do with them is teach them how to swim. Now, the legend is in my family that I was like a fish. Like they, my family, the way they taught me to, to swim was literally they just grabbed me threw me in and I started swimming. Like that's, that's the, the legend at least. Um, I, which either says that my parents have a lot of faith in me and my abilities, or they're trying to get rid of me. One of the two, they just like sink or swim. We'll see, we'll see. We'll see if it works out for him or not. And so um, when I taught my kids to swim, I thought, okay, I wonder if they have it, right? They, I, I was like, I have faith that they can do this. And so uh, Selah is, she, she didn't take long to take to swimming. I put her in and she figured it out pretty quick. Now she's like deep diving and she's just like out there. She'll swim for hours. We go to the beach, she swims for hours. She's not afraid of any water, you know, deep, deep or shallow, it doesn't matter. Um, and then I have my Leah, my, my, my middle one who's seven. And when I first started to work with her, she was just a little skeptical of the water. It's probably because she's deathly skinny, like she has no fat on her body and she like sinks like a rock. Like she knows, she knows there's something to fear about water, but she's figuring it out. And she's, you know, bobbing a little bit, and she's figuring it out as, as she goes. And then you have um, Mila, my littlest one. Now, my littlest one, she has zero fear, like zero fear, like 
there's no concept of drowning or anything. She's the one who's just whole hog, just jumps in, doesn't matter if she can swim or not, and she just acts like she does. She thinks it's all imaginative, right? I got this! Um, it doesn't matter. And so you got to keep an eye on her. Now, I bring up this. Um, not only do I want to go swimming later, and I wish it would get warm so I could go swimming with my kids. Um, I bring this up because in this, as a parent, I have to have a lot of faith in my kids that they can figure this out right? I have to have a lot of faith. I can show them stuff. I can do it. But there's a lot of faith involved. And when Rob asked me to come speak in this, you know, series on a uh, heartbeat, right? Uh, can you hear my heart? Um, he asked me, to, he said, what's on your heart right now? And what was on my heart was not like something of passion, if I'm honest. Like, I'm actually at the bottom of the barrel with my passion lately. Like, I'm, I'm kind of scraping by in my faith passion, if you would. Um, but the question that was on my heart is this one. What kind of faith is Jesus looking for? And so when he asked me to speak, I said, I'd like to speak on faith and exploring the faith that Jesus is looking for. See, I have a love-hate relationship with faith, if I'm honest. Um, there's times when it's awesome, and there's times when it's horrible. There's times where I've seen God showed up in amazing ways, and I had no idea how he's going to show up, and he, and he did. And I have other times where it was the total opposite. I thought for sure this is what God wanted, and I find myself at the bottom of the barrel, scraping along on the fumes of my faith. Um, now, if you know me at all, um, and my journey, especially for like here through New Hope, some of your faces look familiar, other ones, I have no idea who you are. Um, please introduce yourself. I'd love to get to know you a little bit more. But... Um, I came to New Hope because there was, there was this little passion in me. There was this faith that I felt God was saying, like, hey, I've called you to reach people far from God and help them find their identity and destiny in Christ. But I had no idea how to do that. And I heard, hey, there's a church plant down, down in Loudonville. You might want to go be a part of that. Like, God seems to be doing something there. And so I was like, okay, I'll, 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 I'll figure it out. And so um, I took that little step of faith and started coming here, started serving here. And um, now, b to back up a little bit, I grew up in this, in a family that was kind of divided. Like, my, 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 my dad, he, he grew me up on faith in all the classics. And what I mean by that is, like, ACDC and Led Zeppelin and um, all this thing. And then my mom, she would take me to church with my, you know, her, her family. And we'd be, you know, my grandpa would drag me to church and we'd go to church. And so I really had no, con I had a relationship with Jesus. I was good with him as my rescuer. I like, I like, dude, I like this guy. He saves me. He's there for me whenever I need him. I, I, I'm in. And so, uh, but I never really realized that there was like some tension between this. Like on the way to, to church, we'd be driving in our cars and I'd be singing Hell's Bells, right? And then I would go in and sing, sing How Great Thou Art and then back to, you know, Highway to Hell. And I didn't realize that there was like some kind of conflict there um, <laughs> until much later in life. And so uh, in college, God kind of wrecked me and said like, hey, you've been good with this rescuer thing but would you be good with me leading as well? And at that time, I started to surrender to him. So um, that's when that birth of that faith of him wanting, you know, to reach people far from God, just like in a lot of ways my family was far from God, and in a lot of ways I was far, far from God until I saw him for who he, who he was. And so um, I was here at Loudonville, and I felt more and more called to, like, I think God's calling me into church planning. And then they said, hey, we're going to start a campus. I was sitting in seats like you, and hey, we're going to start a campus. Um, maybe God's calling you to, to be a part of that. And so I left, uh, I, I came on staff and actually helped do that. I left my career, my, my life, my education as a technology coordinator in schools, work, working with Roy, I actually worked with Roy, and he got me out all, all kinds of jams, Pastor Roy here. Um, I actually met Roy at work, not here at church. And so it's funny how God has a sense of humor and work, works, weaves paths back together. And so I left that completely. I said, okay, I'm not equipped in any way, shape, or form. I don't have a, a degree. Uh, I have nothing. So I left that and, and pursued this and helped start the campus. And there was uh, ups and downs with that. There was seeing God show up and then trying to figure out how we're going to make it and all these kinds of transitions along the way. And then uh, God then led us to plant a church in Cleveland. And there was this awesome thing of, like, starting a church and reaching people far from God and seeing people from all kinds of different walks come to faith and people from different ethnicities and stuff. And, and different partnering with different organizations in the city, seeing them come around something, and they're like, you're a church? Why are you here to love and service? So we saw all this kinds of amazing stuff. 
And through that journey, we had moments of, of seeing miracles, like seeing people healed. And, but we've also seen times when people, prayers didn't get answered. And people who we loved are no longer with us. We saw all kinds of stuff of like God providing in ways that we never thought imaginable. And then we had other times where we thought for sure he was going to come through. And, and he didn't. See, I have a love-hate relationship. So much um, that even like two years ago, um, me and my wife were receiving so much healing and going through, we were receiving so much freedom, but God led us to end the church. See, I'm not somebody who struggles with hearing the voice of God. Some people are like here, and you're like, I don't know what you're talking about, Kevin. See, my, my problem is I hear him all the time speaking to me through, through his word and encouraging me through different things, and, and I just don't want to do it. You know, I'm like, I don't want to do that. Like, God, we've just been through that. Um, like, I've just been through that. And so uh, at the end of our church plant, I was just like, okay, God, anything, whatever you want to do. And he's like, well, I want you to end the church and release people to other places. And I was like, really? Because then it feels like I got to start over. Like, it's like, yep. Like, we didn't have to end. We had, you know, enough to limp along for a while, you know, to try to figure it out what's next. But I felt God saying, no, it's time to release them. On, to other churches, to other missions. And so we ended the church, which then led us in this weird, wandering season for two years, which led me to this question that I'm wrestling with today, and maybe you are too. I mean, faith can be confusing, right? The idea of faith and, and really no, trying to understand what kind of faith is God, is Jesus looking for? I mean, all through the scriptures, we can see people with lack of faith. We can see people with little faith. We can see scriptures where Jesus is challenging the blind faith or, or to have blind faith. You just all the time, there's always this thing that's faith comes over. He talks about faith as a mustard seed. All these different times, faith can move mountains. And you're going, what is this faith all about? I bet if you're honest, you've had questions about faith. And, and if you're here and you've been here, uh, whether you're drug here, kids, probably you, um, however you got here, whether you're here and you're in the middle of a, a personal crisis, personal stuff going on in your life, I'm glad you're here because I think God has something for you if you just walk with me through this journey of exploring this. What kind of faith is Jesus really looking for? Now get out your Bibles, get out your phones if you have one. If you don't have one, uh, there's free Bibles out here. I literally want you to get out your Bibles if you have them because I want you to be able to know where these scriptures are, to have them. Um, if you need a Bible, you can st steal one from out there. We're Christians. We have to forgive you. If you like your neighbor's Bible, steal theirs because uh, they have to forgive you too. Check to see if they're a Christian first because they might punch you in the face. So just, just, just forewarning. So get it. we're going to be in Matthew 14, chapter 14, verse 25. Um, see, the great thing about Christian faith, Christian faith is that we just don't have this old book See, the point of the Bible wasn't this. We had this old book that was downloaded for us to, to know what it's like to, to live right. Sure, it has some things about how to live right. Sure, it has um, different things. See, the, but the point of the Bible was these people who actually seen it, who actually lived it, who actually had doubts and had to learn how to have faith. That's what's so unique about our faith is that it's not something that's like, here, one man downloaded and gave it to you. It's this library of people trying to explore what does it mean to follow God, and it paints a picture of who God is, so much that there was this guy named Jesus who showed up, and Jesus claimed not only um, to be from God, but to be God, and that he called, he said, like, look, I came to live for you, to live life you couldn't, so that you could then ex swap out, uh, so I could give you everything that you don't deserve, and he said, said it so much, he's like, I'm gonna even die for you, and he's like, I'm gonna call the date, it's gonna be that date, and this is, I'm gonna die for you, and they were like, their minds were blown. They couldn't even say, like, what? That doesn't even make sense. They thought he was just talking in hyperbole. And then he did it. See, our faith really uh, it starts with this place of reason. That everybody who came to, to, to who Jesus was comes from this place of, this doesn't make sense. And you can see that throughout the scriptures. Matthew is an account uh, from one of Jesus' earliest followers. And he, f he was following Jesus. And so he wrote down what he saw. And later, when he saw him rose from the dead, he's like, this is somebody we need to think about what he did for us and they're willing to even die for it so the only reason i tell you that is because i think faith starts with reason right you're struggling with something and you're coming here and you're looking for some reasons to live your your, your relationships are falling out and you're looking for some reasons to get you through you're looking for some hope whatever it might be i think all faith 
starts with reason, but it doesn't always end there. So t- today we're going to look at somebody who, who, um, who is somebody of bold faith. Bold, bold faith. And Matthew writes it down. He was an eyewitness and he wrote this. And uh, the, the person we're going to be talking about is Peter. You may have heard this story before. It's Peter when he saw Jesus walking on the water. Um, so we're in chapter 14, verse 25. And uh, now, right before this, uh, this is on the Sea of Galilee. And now, for those of you who've never been to the Sea of Galilee, I've had the privilege of being there. The sea of Galilee is not this big ocean. When we think sea, we read sea, we think of this big, massive ocean, right? Like we think of this, uh, a sea, like the way we think of it. It's, the truth is, it's not even as big as a great lake. Like I live on Lake, by, by Lake Erie. I wish I lived on Lake Erie. I live by Lake Erie. And uh, it's significantly smaller than that. Actually, if I had to kind of describe it, it's like Pleasant Hill, you know, Pleasant Hill Reservoir area, except it's a lot wider. So you can literally see across it. Does that make sense? It's about that long, but it's also a lot wider. And so you can actually see all the ends of it. You can see it. It's far, but you still can see where land is at all times. And so this, this story happens right after Jesus was doing ministry, was uh, healing people and, and doing his thing. And what he said is, hey, go out on the boat, go across. I'm going to spend some time with God. I'm going to spend some time in prayer, and then I'll meet you on the other side. And so Jesus' followers are out on the boat, and they're waiting for Jesus um, to show up. They're kind of going to the other side. And it says this. It says, shortly before dawn, it, oh, uh, and right before this, a storm started to kind of come up on the lake. It describes that the waves were getting kind of choppy. And if you have a small sea, the choppier it is, right? Like, if you have a big ocean, it takes a lot of, like, oomph to get it. But if a storm comes and you have a small sea, it's like a bathtub when a kid jumps in it. It starts starts going like this and getting crazy. And so this storm is happening. And all of a sudden, it says, shortly before dawn, a, a, more of a word, word, word for word translation was saying someone was watching around dawn, which would be like 3 to 6 a.m. So it was really early in the morning. It says, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. Now, remember I said faith starts with reasonable faith, but it doesn't stay there. If you follow Jesus very long, if you read very long into this, if if you learn to to try to put faith in Jesus, you realize he doesn't just want reasonable faith. He wants more than that. And so he says, uh, they saw him walking on the lake. Some of you guys are like, I'm out, Uh, but stick with me. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. Immediately fear is striking them. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, and do not be afraid. Peter speaks up, Lord, if it is you, tell me to come to you on the water. He says, bold faith. He's saying, like, whoa, wait a minute, you're walking on water? I want to be with you. And he takes this bold step of faith and asks him, and, and Jesus says, come, come. Then Peter got out of the boat and walked on water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind and he was afraid and began to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. In this middle of the storm, he catches him and says, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now this this phrase, ye of little faith, is found five times in the book of Matthew. And, and when we see this here, um, I think we get this picture uh, of a little different picture of Jesus. See, most of us, I think we have this picture of Revlon Jesus, passion, you know, Revlon hair Jesus, who's all about peace and happiness and, and puppies. He's always with lambs and all this stuff. Um, but here, it seems like we get a different Jesus, right? A, diff- a, a Jesus that has an edge to him, uh, like he's a disappointed Jesus, or maybe Darth Vader Jesus, right? I find your lack of faith disturbing. Right? Like, this is what we, we, we picture. We picture Jesus le- leaning out of the boat and grabbing his hand and, and, and challenging him. And it might be true that he was a little disappointed uh, in Peter and his followers. But I think this f- phrase, he was trying to get at something. He was trying to teach them something about the faith that he desired. See, this, this phrase, ye of little faith, shows up five times. In, the, in Mark's, or Matthew's, sorry, Matthew's gospel, Matthew's accounts. And I don't, in Matthew, um, like all Jewish people at that time, were master, was, a, was a master storyteller. 
See, their culture, the way they passed down everything was by story. So all of them knew how to tell a story. And when they would put something in the story, there was a reason. See, when Matthew was recording this, and he keeps saying, ye of little faith, ye of little faith, ye of little faith, he's dropping hints that Jesus was trying to teach them something specific. Why so little faith is what that can be translated into. And as I was studying for this, there's two words in the New Testament for faith. First is, um, is this, is this fine family, like, it, it sounds like this, pa- pastos, which this is a kind of faith that I would describe as a believing faith. Like, do you believe this? Or assurance faith, meaning like, I am sure that this happened. And so there's this faith, and that word's shown all the time throughout the New Testament. It's, it's usually in dialogue between people who are trying to figure out what they believe, and it's like, do you have faith? And it's this, this one word, this assurance faith that I call, or belief faith, which I think is absolutely important. But Jesus here is trying to teach them something very different, and he uses a different word, and it's this. And I'm not great at Greek, so, you know, I apologize in, in advance. It's eliogopesta, which is like, I got Italian, I think, there at the end. I don't think that's right. But um, <laughs> he, he, he uses this different word for faith. It has that root that we talked about over there, assurance or belief, but he says this different kind of faith. And, and the, the faith, it, that word that goes along with it is like about a duration or a patience or a st- holding on to what you got, this little faith, hold on to it. See, I think Jesus is trying to say that it's not about being assured and knowing you're right. It's about trusting me with whatever little faith you have, with any doubt that you have. Do you you see that? Are you with me? Because if you don't, we got nothing to talk about the rest of the day. So we got to get with me. Assurance faith versus a duration faith. A faith of just saying, give me what you got. Stick with me. Stick with me. That's what it says. He says, ye of little faith ye of little faith. Come with me. Give me what you got. This ye of little faith phrase shows up five times in Matthew's gospel. And I'm going to run through them real quick. They go like this. First, Jesus is on the Sermon on the Mount, and he's telling them about the situation. He's saying, like, uh, he has thousands of people. He's preaching in kind of a setting like this. And he says, he says, hey, do you see the birds? Do you see the birds? God takes care of them. He gives them what they need. You don't have to store it up in barbs. He's like, I give them what they need. And the grass, the grass of the fields, those, they're clothed. They're taken care of. O ye of little faith, he says. He looks to you and says, look, whatever provision you're worried about, whatever not having enough means to you, I'm, duration, give me what you got. Give me that little bit and give me the doubt too. And I'm going to make it into something. I take care of the birds and the fields. I take care of the grass. I'll, how much more will I take care of you, Lee, ye of little faith? See, I think Jesus is saying, like, you have worry, but you still are seeking me? Give me that little faith, and I'll make it in something. Lean in. Trust me. With that, I want to change that, the little bit of faith that you have into faithfulness that comes from me. The next time it's found in the Gospel of Matthew is this fear in a storm. Now, this is not the same one as the time Peter walked on water. It's a different time. This is the time where Jesus is already on the boat. He's taking a nap in the back of the boat on a pillow, and they are freaking out. There is a storm coming up, and they are like, Jesus, Jesus, we're going to die. We're going to die. And they're like, they finally wake him up. They're like, don't you see like this? And he's like, oh, ye of little faith, and he rebukes the storm. The fear welled up with him in them, and he said, look, just give me, ye of little faith, just give me, give me the little bit, and I will work this out. The next time is Peter. And what's interesting about that passage is Peter loses faith. But what did he lose faith in? He loses faith in, in the faith that Jesus had for him to walk on water. Jesus called him out of the boat. He said, I want to walk on water with you. I want to be like you. I want to do what you do. And he says, come on, step out. Walk on the water. I have faith in you. You can do this. And it said then he loses faith. He's like, well, I saw the storm, and I don't, I don't know that I can do this. I don't know that you are calling me to that. And he falls in the water, and Jesus captures him. See, that faith, the ye of little faith, is a faith in you, the faith in us as followers, those who want to seek after him and do what he has done. The fourth one is this time where he's talking about the self-righteousness of the Pharisees. 
and he said, these Pharisees, they, they think they got it all together. They have to know everything. See, they, they think they're self-righteous because of all they know about the scriptures. They are so smart. And I'm telling you, they are like, they're like um, yeast that goes through dough. They ruin it, actually. Not a good thing. This is actually a bad thing. And he says, if you want to be, be seen by everybody, you want to be self-righteous, you want power over other people, you can do that. But ye of little faith, I have something different for you. I have something where you can be known, that you can be in relationship with you, that, you, that you're not looking for power over people, but you're given power so you can love other people. He challenges that, and he says, all I need is a little faith. You think you have to know it all, know all the scriptures before you step out and do something for him? You've got to know everything about who God is? No, he's just saying, just give me a little bit of faith, and I can work through it. And the last time, Jesus has brought a little boy, and they say, we were trying to get this demon out of this guy. And he says, oh, you ye of little faith. He said, if you had faith like a mustard seed, just a teeny tiny bit, just give me this little little bit, you can do greater things than this. You can move mountains. You can change the world. All I need is this little faith over a long portion of time. It reminds me of my daughter, Myla, right? Um, two, three years ago, she was like three. Um, we were at a a ministry retreat, and she falls in, um, there's this old pool, this old pool um, from like the 70s, it's an above ground pool, it's probably about four feet, four and a half feet high, and had like this rail that was like an inch and a half, or like a foot and a half um, around it, and, and she was walking around it, and it was fine because I was swimming with her all day, but remember, Myla's the fearless one, she's the one that has zero fear, like, so she's walking around it, and I, dad, as her dad, I'm looking at her from about 15 yards out, and I see her, and I'm like, ah. Oh. There's a bunch of kids in the pool, and I see her miss a step and <laughs> into the water, right? And immediately, I'm yelling at them, and I've never ran so fast, right? I bolt, and I jump in the water, so trying to get the kids to grab her. I grab her and pull her up, and she comes up. She comes up smiling, you know? Uh, she comes up smiling like, no big deal, Dad. Like, I about drowned, but no big deal. No fear. No fear. She comes up. See, Mila isn't afraid of the water because she has faith in her father, is what I believe. She knows, like, he's going to save me. He's going to be there for me. He's going to do it, so I'm not afraid of what might happen. She knows that I have faith in her, that she's going to figure out how to swim. She's going to learn how to, to swim in the deep end of the pool, if you will. And so she has no fear of taking those steps, of falling in and messing up, because she knows I'm going to be there for her. And I think that's what God wants to be for each one of you. Hugh Halter says it this, this way. If, if you want a safe faith, you will never really know God because he doesn't hang out in the shallow end much. See, I think some of you haven't put any faith in him, so you haven't seen him show up. You've been hanging out in the shallow end where it's comfortable, and he's calling you to do things that you've never thought you could do. He wants to call you out into the deep end. All he needs is a little bit. You just need a little bit. Just a little bit. Trust me with both your doubts and that little bit of faith you got. Just give me your little bit. Give me a little bit. Over and over again, Jesus says it's not about the amount of your faith. See, and we know this to be true, not just with Jesus, but other things. Uh, the, something I want you to take home is this. The object of your faith is more important than the amount of it. I'll say it again. The object of your faith is more important than the amount of it. Bring this picture up. This picture is of two planes. And I really want to do this for you. If you looked at those two planes and I said, hey, which one do you have faith will fly? Which one do you have faith that you, will, you would get on right now and take a trip on? Anybody willing to just talk with me? Raise your hand. Anybody? Yeah, which one would you get on? The big one. Why? More up to date? That's a good answer. Modern. What, what else? What other reason might you, might you get on that plane over the other one? What? not stuck in the building. I don't think the other one's stuck in a building. I think it's out front of it, but it has more power. Yeah. How do you know that, though? How do you know that? Thank you. This is what I'm getting at. The reason we know that second one will fly is because we've seen it. 
That is the only reason. If I take someone from the 1900s, someone who was born in the 1900s, showed you both of those planes and said, hey, which one do you think is gonna, gonna fly? There is no way they're gonna pick the big one. They're gonna say, that big one looks like a submarine. It looks like a whale. You put that in the water, it'll go to the bottom. That's where that thing goes. And they would look at the second one. They say, how are you gonna get all that weight up in the air? Nothing's ever flew. Nothing's ever done that, right? That's what they would say, but they look at that other one. They're like, kind of looks like a bird. I'll take my chances with that one. I'll take my chances with that one. See, the reason you know that the other one will fly is not because it's modern. It looks like it's being pulled around by a car, for gosh sakes. The reason you know it's going to fly is because you've seen it before. See, I believe that you have seen God move in your life. You've seen him do things. And even if it's just a little bit, you're going to trust him with it more. When you get on a plane for the first time, you have faith in it because you've seen it fly. But let me be honest, you're, you're not like, you don't have faith in it yet, right? You get on it, and you're nervous. You're nervous for the longest time until you realize, all I have to do is kind of sit down and trust this ride. There's nothing I can do. Once I, put my, once I step on that plane, i got to trust it to see the rest of the way out. And that's what faith is really like. You have to learn to trust. Faith leads to faithfulness, and faithfulness leads to trust. And that's what God's getting at. He's like the father who reaches in and grabs the kid, and they're not fearful because they know they're in his hands. He's like, he's like the, he's like the, um, he's like Jesus grabbing Peter and having that moment in the middle of the storm. It's all going on. I want to have this moment though, right here, right here. Ye of little faith, I've got you. You can do this. You can do this. See, the object of our faith is way more important than the amount. And although you have doubts, and I understand, I have doubts too. I can't get away from the, the, the fact that faith won't let go of me. Like, even if I wanted to let go of it, it won't, won't leave me alone. And I find that I've seen it fly. I've seen it. I've seen marriages healed. I've seen it. I want to do it again. I've seen people healed, and I say, do it again. I want to live into that. I don't want to sit back and say, like, I just want to bottom out the rest of my life. Now, I don't know what about you. Uh, Some of you probably come from faith traditions or have had maybe baggage from churches that says, hey, you just don't have enough faith. You don't have enough faith. If you just had some more faith, you'd be healed. That person would be saved. This thing would change. And I want to tell you, that's a lie. Because it's not about the amount of faith. It's about trusting him with the little that you got. God might be working something in you that whole process, to trust him more, to let his faithfulness towards you become something that becomes a part of you towards him, that his faithfulness towards you has become a faithfulness towards him. See, Jesus is looking to turn our little faith into a faith-filled life, that even when the storms come, we can walk on water. Matthew, remember, in Matthew, it said, when he, when he came to step out on water, he said, come, he said, and then Peter got out of the boat and walked on water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the winds, and he was afraid, he began to sink and cried out, Lord, save me! Immediately, Jesus reached out in his hand and caught him. He said, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? And then, then after he has that moment of working through the storm with him, whatever um, the storm might be, he calls and pulls him in. And then he says, uh, and then it says, those who, who are on the boat worship, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. O ye of little faith. Let's see, do you have the picture? O ye of little faith. If cats can walk on water, you can walk on water. If Satan's minions can walk on water, you can walk on water. I'm just joking. Cats aren't that bad. But, but for some of you, you're afraid to get out of the boat. See, I believe some, God's been nudging you, God's been calling you, some of you, to do something to have that conversation, to, to connect with that person, and you've said, I can't do it. God's calling you to, 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 to do something, and you're just fearful to step out of the boat. But Jesus is there to catch you, to get out. He's saying, I'm here for you. I want to work this through because I want to put something in you that you couldn't get otherwise. If you don't step into this challenge, this, this act of faith that I'm calling you to, this fa- maybe act of passion of faith that you have in you that you haven't pursued, that he can't reveal that to you. For other of you, you know you're stuck in a place you really don't want to be. You're stuck. Um, you're, 
stuck in a, a job you don't want to be at. You're stuck doing something, but you know that God's in it for some reason. And you just, I can't leave yet. Give him that little faith. Give him those questions that you have through this and say, what do you want to teach me? Now, when City Edge ended, I had no idea how God was going to provide. For two years, I consulted for churches and businesses on, on how to reach people kind of outside their scope or outside of their, you know, their reach. And um, I had no idea how God was going to provide. I just, God, you wanted to release these people. Okay, I have no money. Now, how are you going to provide? And God, over and over again, I woke up and had to learn to t- trust him each day. So when Jesus prays, give us this day our daily bread, I had to live into that promise because I had no idea how money was going to come. And for two years, obviously, um, your wife is a little stressed out when this happens. Um, But we saw over and over again, we're living on credit cards, and we had no idea how God was making ends meet. And I never did the math. I never wanted to go back and do the math because it didn't make sense. I knew this is our income, this is our expenses. And yet each month, even whenever credit cards would come due, boom, he'd pay them off. And for two years, boom, he paid them off. And at the end of our church, um, I had this kind of prophetic work spoke over me. Um, I describe myself as charismatic as a seatbelt. Um, Rob says I'm charismatic with a roll cage. So I don't, for those who are race car drivers, you know what I'm talking about. Um, everybody else is like, what are you talking about? Um, that someone said, I think God's calling you back into the marketplace. I want nothing to hear. I didn't want nothing with that. It's like, I came out of the marketplace, left being a technology coordinator to do this, and now you've called me, you're going to call me back into that? i got to reboot my career, every credential or any, any, you know, proof that I'm good at anything besides ministry is gone? That's what you're calling me back into? And so as of two months ago, he got me, God led me into this job with this large Fortune 500 company, software company, um, it's like the Google of Cleveland, like 3,000 people work there, like all of Loudonville would work there uh, if it was here in Loudonville. And, um, and I just find myself in this stranger in a strange land, and I'm having to learn how to, like, God, I was good at doing this. I was good at having this kind of faith, preaching and doing this and sharing my faith outside the church and sharing it in my home, but you're calling me to this now? I have no idea what this is going to look like. And he's saying, just got a little bit, just got a little bit, just got a little bit. That's all I need. I'm going to show you. Bring your doubts. Bring your questions. I'm going to show you. Just lean in. Now, that's me. What's it for you? Right now, I want you to grab out your phones if you got them. Um, I'm going to literally do something probably never done here. Um, it's a little different. I'm going to put up my phone number, and I want you guys to s- save my phone number. Um, put it in. My name's Kevin Rush, if you forgot by now. Um, and I just want you to put my number, 216-236-3970. And what we're going to do is I'm going to give you a chance to go public with me. And by public, I just mean to me. Kind of public, private. Maybe something God's stirring in you and saying, like, you need to step out in faith. You need to get off the boat. I've said, come out. You know it. You know I spoke to you. You know it's time to take that step. And so I'm going to walk you guys through that. And I just want you to text me whatever that is. You don't have to put your name on it. Just text me. This is the step that I know God's been calling me to. And I've been scared to do it. I've been looking at that that list of the circumstances of all the things that have gone wrong. God, I'm worried that there won't be enough provision. I got a little faith. That's all you need. God, I'm, I'm, I'm scared of the circumstances outside my door. Don't worry about it. Just give me a little faith. Maybe you're like, God, I know you're, you're calling me into something completely different. I'm scared. I don't know what to do. Give me it. Others of you, you know you're called to stay in a situation maybe you don't like, in a, in a, in a way you don't want to do it. But God's just saying, give me a little bit. Stay, stick with it. You never know what I can do with that. And who knows, I might be doing something in you that I could only do if you stick with it. Give him that little bit of faith. It's about duration faith, not assurance faith. Assurance faith grows as we trust him with the duration faith, the questions, the doubts. So what step of faith have you been ignoring? What's the step of faith that that God's speaking to you right now that that if you would step off the boat, you're worried about falling off, but God will grab you and call you back in. Say, I got this. I got you. Oh, you have little faith. Just give me a little bit. Just give me a little bit. As I was praying, I'm just convinced that God wants to heal marriages here. And God's, whether you could be in the middle of something 
messy right now in your own marriage, your own relationship, but God wants to use you to work through that and then to be um, an opportunity to do it again to other people, that you become a, a person, a couple that's offered, that can offer other people hope, that can show them a way out through faith. Maybe that's you. And maybe you say, there's no way. Just give me a little. Just give me a little. I, I also, as I was praying about um, New Hope, is it seems that there's there's been a gap. We got some kids, and we got some older people now. I'm in that group. But we're missing this generation. And I think some of you are in that generation, and some of you know people in that generation, but you're not having that conversation. You're not bridging that gap and God's been nudging you about it to have those conversations to step out in faith step out in faith to step out in faith and I pray you do that if that's you I want you to text it to me if there's any other myriad of things if you're just weathering the storm you're saying I need faith to weather this storm just text it to me I want to encourage you I want to just want to encourage you what step of faith are you going to take today so um, we're going to sing will you stand I'm going to pray over you um, so God, I thank you for these sons and daughters of yours, that you're doing stuff, that you're speaking to them, that you want to do stuff in their life. And it's not about the amount of faith, God. It's about the duration. It's about them giving them your doubts, trusting you with their doubts as well as their faith. That you're not Darth Vader, Jesus, over chastising us, but you're calling us like a loving father to catch us when we say, save me. But God, let us have big, bold faith where we experience you and let's have a duration that lives it out. God, if we have to err on one, just let's err on this a little bit. Just give us, give you what we have just a little bit. So God, as we sing, I pray you do it again in our hearts. That you do it again in our hearts. It's your name I pray.